Thompson to just take his liberty in the Lord to sing and praise the Lord and to bring us whatever the Holy Spirit has laid upon his heart for this service tonight. Dwight, we love you. Come and give us the word of God. Oh, what can you say? He's been doing that a long time. Coleman, you'll have to get used to that. Something great so happening in this land, I, I don't know how to describe it. You know, the Spirit of the Lord showed me something tonight that was going to happen. And I've seen it so much this week. I've just become uh, to the place where I can believe God can just about do anything but fail. And he's already shown me that miracles are going to happen, not in just two or three lives, but literally everyone that has come to this room for a miracle, you are going to leave with your miracle tonight. You are going to leave with your miracle. I've seen more people slain in the power this week, literally by the dozens and the hundreds just slain in the power of the Holy Ghost at one time. I've seen miracles take place. God's done something in our life that it's almost scary. I don't know how to describe it. But I'll tell you, I'm on a honeymoon. Zonel is too, and it's not with each other. We love each other just the same, but we've both found our, our new love again all over and over again in Jesus. We, all we want to do is sit around reading our Bibles and say, look here what I've found. I've seen it before, but it's never meant what it means to me to know. I, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised tonight if just hundreds of people, while they're being healed, and you've got to remember, you're in a historical building. This is where the beloved and beautiful Miss Catherine Kuhlman preached her ministry in Los Angeles, whom we will always love and thank God for. But I wouldn't be surprised if 50,000 people have not been slain in the power of the Holy Ghost in this room right here under the ministry of Catherine Kuhlman. And you know, I, 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 I was praying in the Spirit, and, and the Lord helped me today to pray, even just before the service, to get in about 30 minutes of praying in tongues, praying in the Holy Spirit. And the Lord's been talking to me about praying in the Holy Spirit, even singing psalms in the Spirit. That's what the Scripture says in Ephesians. Paul says, singing psalms in the Spirit, singing spiritual psalms. Well, somebody says that scripture, well, who would know more about singing psalms unto the Lord better than the Holy Spirit that's within you? Who would know more about it? And the Lord seemed to show me tonight that literally hundreds of people are not only going to receive their miracle, but simultaneously you're just going to be slain in the Holy Spirit. The Lord has also shown me in the Holy Spirit tonight and two people's face. If I were to walk in the crowd, I can find you because I've seen your face. He's shown me two people. One is a man, one is a woman. They're both over 48 years of age. And both of them has recently had severe heart attacks. You've come to this service out of desperation. You walk in this service with fear. Faith is about to grip your heart and drive fear out. And you are going to be completely healed and the Lord is going to give you a new heart. The first person that was ever slain in the ministry of John Wesley, the great man that founded the Methodist Church, the Wesleyan Methodist Church, the first time John Wesley ever saw that after the Holy Ghost filled him with the Spirit, after he was filled with the Spirit, he was slain in the power of the Holy Ghost. 
And after that, he preached that first night, and he never saw it before, but that first night after being filled with the Holy Spirit, he was preaching. And all of a sudden, a woman sitting on the front seat, he had never seen it in his life, first time it ever happened, the woman just got up and, as we use an expression, just killed over. Well, it so disturbed John Wesley Fletcher, or rather John Wesley Fletcher. We know John Wesley Fletcher, don't we? I'm so used to saying John Wesley Fletcher, and I'd have never met John Wesley, just read this about him. And it so confused John Wesley that he stopped his meeting. He said, is there a doctor in the house? And there happened to be three. All three of them ran up to examine this woman. One looked at her, then another, then another, and they got together and all conferred and come to the conclusion, as they said to John Wesley, now we don't understand this woman's okay physically. Now her respiratory is all right, her heartbeat seems to be fine, pulse beat checks out okay. But she seems to be in some kind of weird trance. We don't quite understand it. Right then and there, there was a hypnotist also in the congregation that night. Hypnotist comes up, says, may I examine the woman? Maybe she's hypnotized. John Wesley said, you may. He goes down, spends a few moments, comes back, and she's just laying there. He said, now, she's not hypnotized, but there's something strange. So everybody just looked at her, and finally John Wesley couldn't go on with the service. So he said, what we'll do here is just wait. So somebody yelled out in the meeting, stood up and said, John Wesley said, is it of the Lord? And so John Wesley says, I'm not sure if it is of the Lord. Then another one jumped up and said, well, do you suppose it's of the devil? John Wesley says, well, I can't answer really if it's of the devil. But I'll tell you what let's do, he said. Let's all wait around here. And when she comes to, we'll ask her and whoever it is will get the glory. Forty-five minutes later, nobody moved. He didn't preach. He just waited. She came to. And the first thing she did when, he, when she came to was she wiped her eyes, stood up and looked around, and suddenly she turned to John Wesley and she said, Praise the Lord! <laughs> then she said, Then she said, Glory to God! She said, I've just seen Jesus. I've just been to heaven. I've walked up and down with Jesus, and he said to me, child, it won't be long till you'll be here, but go on back and tell the people I'm about finished, so everybody get ready. I'll come after them a little bit later. The great big old George Whitfield, six foot four, came from England. He preached in Boston. He went up in the courthouse steps and started preaching and people were slain in the power of the Holy Ghost. So he went back the next day and he saw people climbing up in trees. They heard about what was happening. George Whitfield, before he started preaching on the Boston courthouse steps, he turned to those people up in those trees and he said, you better get out, out of those trees. He said, the power of God's going to hit you and you'll fall out of those trees and if you're not in the spirit, you'll get hurt. <laughs> Charles G. Finney preached to a large crowd and 400 were slain. They all discovered only those that were unsaved were slain that time and every one of them got up and gave their heart to Jesus Christ. And if that's not enough, the great old Peter Cartwright, six foot four, giant of a man, Traveling, always rode by horseback from one great meeting to another. Stopped in West Virginia, checked into a little inn, combination inn and tavern. There was a great big bulletin board said dance tonight. Checked into his room, person walked up to him, said, sir, you're a stranger in town, come go to the dance tonight. He said, I don't go to dance. Suddenly the Holy Ghost spoke to him and said, Peter Cartwright, go to the dance tonight. Peter Cartwright said, wait a minute, Holy Spirit, have you forgotten I'm Westland ba Methodist and Westland Methodists are holiness and we don't believe in going to dances. Holy Spirit said, trust me, I want you to go to that dance tonight. <laughs> Peter Cartwright showed up at the dance and got over in the corner of it and several hundred people out there doing a square dance and he was leaning up against the wall. He said, all right, Holy Spirit, I'm here, what's going to happen? He said, you'll find out in a minute. Little woman walked up to him, little lady did introduce herself and said, you look like a stranger in town, would you like to dance? 
He said, no thanks, and Holy Spirit said, tell her yes. He said, yes, thanks. <laughs> so he walked out in the center of the floor, and the Holy Spirit said, now. <laughs> said, now. Reached out and took the young lady by the hands, and he looked at her, and only Peter Cartwright had a voice like Peter Cartwright had. They said he, he could speak to thousands and need no amplification. He didn't ever need He just could speak to thousands. He just reached out and grabbed that young lady by the wrist and held her out like this, and he reared back and got a good lung full of air, and he just bellowed out, I don't do anything until I pray first. <laughs> Peter Cartwright got right down on his knees and he began to pray in the Holy Ghost. He began to pray in the Holy Spirit. I, I, I sense the Holy Ghost in this room tonight is here. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He kept praying in the Spirit and he said, okay, Lord, I prayed in the Spirit. What do you want me to do? He said, keep praying in the Spirit. Then he began to give the interpretation and it said, now these heathen will see the power of God. And about that time, while he was on his knees, face to the floor, praying in the Holy Ghost, he heard something go thud. <laughs> and he cracked one eye just in time to see that young lady prostrate in the floor. <laughs> then in a minute, he heard something go thud, thud, thud. <laughs> Suddenly he heard the quit playing he knew it was a fiddler something went thud crash bang ding a ling <laughs> then he heard a big bass guitar fall and that went thud and bam then he heard something go bam bam thud thud clean clean bang bang and God wiped out the whole band at one time Then he got kept on praying, thud, thud, bang, bang, crash, boom. It sounded like everything was falling apart. The Holy Ghost said, now I'm through. Open your eyes and looked around and 300 people inside that barn had been slain under the power of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you will be healed tonight because of the word. So what faith is, faith is acting on what God says. Simply agreeing with the word. In St. Luke's chapter, the fifth chapter, the fifth chapter of St. Luke, I want to read only two verses of scripture. Now let me tell you what's happened. Simon and his friends and two ships have been fishing all night. Now listen, if you've ever listened, just listen tonight. I don't care if you applaud, just applaud, because I love it and so do you. We just can't help it, can we? It's in us and that's it. So they'll just have to get used to it. We just applaud. I mean, that's it. We love Jesus. And look at that banner up there. We love Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? We love Jesus and we do love Jesus Christ. Now, Simon and his friends had been fishing all night long. I mean, the whole night. I'm just, going to, I'm just going to preach. I'm not up here to prove anybody I can preach. That's not even important. Who cares whether I can or can't? I've got something better to make you think I can preach. I've got the Word, and that's everything. I mean, I've got the Word. I've, listen, as Jan said, Dwight, you just look different. Jan, you're right. I'm different. I'm not the same man I was one week ago. I've never seen so many miracles. Vicki Jamison, a few weeks ago, laid her hands on us in PTL and said what God was going to do. And I felt something then, but I never knew, Vicki, what it was going to be. And the Lord's done some things this week that scared me. He showed me people that's had diseases and helped us to, to just simply call them out and tell them. And then God's healed them and see them go away saying, I'm healed by the power of God. It's almost scared me. But I'm telling you, I've just come to live in this book. I mean, this word, people will heal you. I don't care how you feel. I don't care if old Roberts has prayed for you or whoever has prayed for you. It's really immaterial. There is one thing that will heal you, and it's the word of the living God. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's the word. It's the word. Act on the word. <laughs> the 
Jesus walked up to those fishermen, and there they were. They had been in. It was now morning. They had fished all night long, didn't catch a thing. Now look. All of a sudden, Jesus walked up to them, talked to them a little while, and ministered to them. Then he turned to Simon, and he said, Simon, why don't you go on out into the deep? Now, the Bible said they were cleaning up their nets. In other words, they were through. It had been a totally useless night of fishing. And suddenly Jesus said to Simon, he said, Simon, now let me tell you something. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just simply get in your boats, get those two ships, and all of you go on back out there and cast your nets into the sea and just uh, fill up the boats. In the natural, Simon could have said, how silly, Lord. Don't you know we've been out there all night? It's the silliest thing I've ever heard. They're just not biting. Or if they're biting, they're not biting what we're throwing at them. Or they won't look at our nets and Charlie and his friends go the other way. <laughs> so all of a sudden, but Simon didn't say that. Here's what he said. Lord, we have toiled all night. But this verse of scripture in verse 5 says, Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Say that. Nevertheless, at thy word. Again, nevertheless, at thy word. Turn to your neighbor and say, nevertheless, at thy word. Say it. Now Simon said, Lord, we've toiled all night, but nevertheless at thy word. And the scripture says they went back out into the sea, cast their nets as Jesus instructed them with his word, and they filled up both ships and nearly sank them. Faith is acting on the word of God. You can say, I believe, until you're blue in the face. You can say, I believe the Ten Commandments. I believe the teachings of Jesus. I believe God did, God has, but you have difficulty in saying, God will, dash, 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 now. But the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said to say, say, God is going to now. God is in the now, as Brother Robert says. God is now. You can believe everything the Bible says and still not have a miracle. We can run up and down these aisles. I can romp and stomp and dance and keep you laughing for 30 minutes. And I can, I can get this crowd maybe going and enjoying these blessings and we're worshiping together, but not a one of you will get healed. Unless you believe the word. You can lay your hands on everybody in here, no matter who it is, but unless that person believes the word that is laying on the hands and the person, or else the person that's being, having their head or their heart or their body prayed for with that person, they're not going to be healed until they believe the word. Somewhere in this thing is where we have missed it. We understand the mechanics of the scripture. We understand the literal terminology. We understand what the Bible says and what God has done and what God can do. But the problem seems to lie in associating or appropriating within our life that word to heal us. Face acting on the word. It happened at Jericho. Look what the Bible said. Now listen. Now look. The walls are the most fortified walls possibly of any nation at that time, any city. Jericho was known for the fortification of its military power in those walls. Now look at this. Isn't this crazy? Isn't this the silliest thing you've ever heard? Now look. Nevertheless, at thy word. Here are the Israelites. Here's a great big plan God has given Joshua and the Israelites to take the city of Jericho. Nobody's ever overrun Jericho. But here are the children of Israel outside the walls, 
And God has just spoken to take the city. And so he said, now, Joshua, I want to give you a military strategic plan. I mean, that's the greatest in history. I mean, Joshua, I mean, th this is it. I mean, you've never seen a plan like I'm going to give you. And here's my secret. And this is how you're going to take Jericho. He said, Joshua, first, walk. Second, blow the trumpet. Third, shout. The walls will fall flat. Can you not see Joshua coming back with his secret weapon from God to the children of Israel? All right, here we are. You're, you're the children of Israel. I'm Joshua. Okay, children of Israel, here's what we're going to do. I have just heard from the Lord the greatest plan in history. First, here's how we're going to see those walls come down. I mean, this is it. I mean, you're going to love it, people. I mean, now look, first, here's what I want all of you to do. In the morning, we're going to get up and we're all going to take a walk all the way around the city. Then we're going to blow the trumpets. We're going to get the trumpets in the right place. Then we're going to blow the trumpets. Then we're going to shout. We're going to do this six days. And on the seventh day, we're going to get up and do it seven times. And on the seventh time, when we go around it, at the right time, I'm going to holler, walk, blow, shout. And would you believe it that those great big walls, in those days now, it's proven that those walls, some of them were 10 feet wide and like 40 feet tall. And would you believe that there won't be one stone left on top of any of the rest of them and the walls are going to fall flat? Ah, come on, Joshua, you yell at me and say, don't kid us, go ahead and tell us what we're going to do. We're going to get our rocks and spears and really, you know, storm the front gate. Is that the way we're going to do it? He said, no, God said, walk, blow the trumpet, and then shout, and they'll fall down. <laughs> Nevertheless, at thy word... For the Bible said in that first verse, he says to Joshua, I have already given thee the city. There isn't anything you've got to do, Joshua. There's no battles you've got to fight. There isn't any airplanes you've got to call in. You don't need to call Washington and get a little help. All I want you to do, Joshua, you see the city is already yours. All you've got to do, walk around the walls, shout, or rather blow the trumpet and shout, and they'll fall down. Nevertheless, Lord, at thy word. Okay? Say it. Nevertheless, at thy word. Can you imagine stomping around the walls of Jericho and I can see all those armed guards up on top there? What y'all doing? Well, you won't believe it. I mean, man, you won't. See that guy down there big white head when, that's, that's Joshua. And he told us how we're going to get your city. I mean, oh, you know what he said for us too? He said, you know what we're going to do? All we're going to do is don't get upset. We're just going to walk a while. You know, hey man, we're just going to walk a while. And on the seventh day, we're going to stomp around here seven times. But now let me tell you something. You might ought to get right with God. Because on the seventh day, when we walk the seventh time, you might want to get out off your walls. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? Well, because on the seventh day, when we walk around those walls the seventh time, and then when you hear that trumpet blow and you hear all those people shout, these walls are going to come down. Well, they did, and it did, and they won the victory. And that's that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just that simple. I mean, let's talk about it. You know the story. They stomped around the seventh day, and the seventh time they did it, and the walls fell, and God gave them the victory because God said, I've already given it to you. Let me tell you something. At Calvary, Jesus was crucified for your sins. Before Calvary, he was beaten 39 strikes, for your healing. If he has already been beaten for your healing, what are we doing sick? Either the word of God is true or it's a lie. That's what I've come to the conclusion. Either we believe the word or it's a lie. You can go simply to the Jordan and there is a man by the name of Naaman. Naaman, the Bible said, is the chief of the army of Syria. He was a man of valor, but the Bible says that Naaman was a leper. His servant takes him to see Elisha. 
And Elisha then didn't even come to the door when the servant knocked on the door. He simply sent his messenger when the messenger said, Naaman, the mighty man of valor, the captain of the host of Syria, is outside and he wants to talk to you. He needs healing. He's a leper. Elisha said, I can't come to the door right now, but go and tell Naaman to go dip seven times in Jordan, and when he does, he'll be healed. They come back and they tell Naaman, and it, and, and it infuriates him. He said he's rude. He didn't even come to the door. The least he could have done probably is come to the door and at least talk to me about it. And of all places to go, the Jordan is a filthy river. Why can't we go over in my country in Syria where we've got some beautiful pure ponds? But no, he wants me to go to Jordan. How humiliating. Thank God for a godly servant. He said, why don't you go ahead and do what he told you to do and obey his words? And the Bible said he obeyed the word of the prophet. And when he obeyed the word of the prophet, I can see him trying to get out into that Jordan River and hoping nobody's going to see him. And down he goes. <laughs> he looks around. I wonder what everybody's going to think. I'm just as bad as I've ever been. I'm here. I might as well do it twice. <laughs> and he looks around again. That leprosy's still there. And he says, it's not going to work. I'll believe it. Like, no, the Bible doesn't say it that way. Let me be just a little fun here. He said, go on and finish it. Do what the prophet said. Obey his words. That's what the Bible's telling you to do. Don't wait till you feel something. Don't wait till you feel 41 goosebumps on the back of your neck before you think it's faith. Don't wait till a chicken crows at 3 o'clock in the morning for confirmation. Don't wait till you see an invisible hand writing on the wall. It's for you. Go ahead and stand on the word. He's already healed you. And God said it. And that's that. There ain't anything I can add to that, just the Word of God. That's all I'm giving you is a word. And so the third time he goes down, comes up and says, I'm telling you, this is the silliest thing I've ever done. Three times, I'm still in a mess. Down he goes and he comes up again. He must have said, look at me, I've still got leprosy. And I'm going to see his servant say, well, Master, go on. You've only got three more times. Can't hurt you. You're already wet anyway. And down he goes fourth time. Comes back up and says, it's not going to work. I'm getting out of here. I'm going back and forget it. I'll never speak to Elias. I hope someday I can come back and get him. He said, do it one more time. Went down fifth time. Still not going to six. Went on down. Why don't you try it one more time? What have you got to lose? That's what I want to tell you. What have you got to lose? Just go ahead and act on the word. And believe God can do it and step out. And that's it. And you're going to be healed. Seventh time he went on down, came up, his baby's just, I mean, his skin just like a baby's belly, just as clean and pure, and it worked. You know why? Nevertheless, at thy word, he just took the word and did what he was told to do. <laughs> Jesus one day ran into a blind man. You can read it in the Gospels. This blind man, all of a sudden, he came up and said, Master, I'm blind. I want you to heal me. You know what Jesus did? Isn't this terrible? The only way I know how to illustrate it, it's kind of like this. Jesus looked, the blind man looked down at the ground, and we went like this. <laughs> Isn't that gross? Well, he did. What can I say? It's a word. Just spit on the ground. That's what the Bible said. He spat on the ground. Then Jesus reached down. He just took the, took the spittle and, and the dirt and mixed it all up and made some clay out of it. Now, what in the world would you do if I wanted to pray for you and you was outside and I spit on the ground and took all that? Why, you would hit me. <laughs> well, what do you think he felt like? Jesus just spit on the ground, rolled it all up, made him a couple of little mud pies and plastered it on both of those blind eyes. Then he said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash and you'll be healed. Just go to the pool of Sloan, go ahead and wash, and you're going to be healed. Now, I see the blind man. It's a mile. We know about where it happened, and we figured it out because we've been there about how far. We looked it up. It was about a mile from where this blind man had to walk. Great day in the morning. Why couldn't he have just said, go to the horse trough right next door there and do it? He said, go to the pool of Sloan. Took him a mile to get there. Probably many minutes. Of course, he knew it was his territory. And so he just stumbled along. Then he went along. Now, can you imagine walking through the streets and you got mud all over your eyes? Somebody think, boy, you sure don't believe in bathing. <laughs> Somebody looked at him and said, don't it look terrible? Hey, fellas, you know you got mud on your eyes? Yeah, but you don't understand. You see, G who? G G Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, he told me. Oh, forget it. You wouldn't believe it anyway. And on he goes. 
Nevertheless, at thy word, Lord, we've toiled all night. We're going to take your word for it anyway. If you can't take God's word for it, whose word are you going to take? You're not going to be healed on somebody else's experience. You're going to be healed because of the word. I don't care what anybody else tells you. Anybody tells you anything else, it's a lie. It's what the Bible says. It's the word of God acting on the word is it. Everybody that's healed in these meetings that you hear about anywhere, it's because they acted on the Word of God and they believed it and that's it. And God settles it and there's nothing else to talk about. Just believe the Word and God will do it. And there he goes. He finally gets to that old pool. After all that mud stuck to his eyes, somebody spit on the ground, all that mess all over him. He reached down and washed his eyes. And when he took the clay away and washed it away, he was healed. Nevertheless, at thy word. Somebody says, well, it's not God's will to heal me because I'm suffering for the master's sake. <laughs> Never time to feel this pain in my body. I'm just glorifying God. That's a lie of the devil. Well, it's not God's will for me to be healed. That's a lie, too. I should say it with me. It's a lie. If you think it's God's will, then why did Jesus go all the way to the trouble of getting his back beaten 39 stripes and then tell us, by his stripes I am healed. Healed from what? Brother, I want you to know he came to heal you, not to afflict you. walk up to me one time wanted me to pray for her and so I've learned to do this I've learned to say okay agree with me will you agree with my prayer and I started praying Lord it's your will to heal no first correct me I went along like this and I said thank you Jesus that you're going to heal this woman and I told her now anywhere in here you can't agree with me just let me know because then we're not agreeing the Bible says if any two agree so I'm praying along there and I'm saying oh thank you Jesus for healing this woman and you're about to do a miracle and I'm so glad that it's your will to heal her and all of a sudden I felt something tug like this on my coat she said, I can't agree with that. You told me to tell you if I can't agree with you. She said, I want you to go ahead and pray for him, but I can't agree it's God's will. I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, I'm suffering for Jesus. She said, the doctors have told me in three more months my disc, these discs are deteriorating, and she showed me this brace under this windbreaker, a big old ugly thing stuck up here on her neck here, stuck around here on her stomach, and then the lower part around the hip line, a big old ugly thing about that big made out of metal to hold her, and she said, this is the only way I can walk, and there in front of her was one of those walkers like this. So she looked at me, and she pointed like this. She says, it's God's, this is the way she did. She did it like this. She says, it's God's will for me to be like this. I said, well, I don't believe I'm going to pray for you. She said, you're what? I said, well, I'm not going to pray for you. She said, well, why? Well, I said, you told me it wasn't God's will for, me to, for you to be healed. You said it's God's will for you to suffer. So why are you going to get me in trouble with God and me ask God to heal you and get me in trouble? I'm not going to do it. <laughs> said, no way in the world am I going to do that. I'm not going to pray for you. And I said, in fact, sister, what I think I'd like to do is, I want to lay hands on you. And, and I said, now, you, you're sure that it's God's will for you to suffer? She said, oh, it is. And every time I feel that pain, and I think about all that suffering, and the boy just think when that back breaks, I'm going to really be pleasing God because I'm going to be hurt. And I said, I'll tell you what, let's do. Let you and I agree right now that God's going to, that you're going to get twice as much pain and hurt twice as much as you've ever hurt in your life so you can please God twice as much. She said, you didn't, I did. And I said, well, now let me ask you something. You go into a doctor? She said, I am. I said, why? She said, so he'll make me well. <laughs> I said, now you've got the doctor in, 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 uh, in you're going to get him in trouble with God, and he's going to be in danger of hellfire and brimstone for trying to help you out. I said, you're taking medicine? She said, I am. I said, why? She said, well, I want to feel better. Get all this pain gone. It'll make me well. Now notice this, people, please. Not being, really not being facetious about it or, or in any way making little of her condition. I was making a point and the Holy Spirit told me to do it and it worked. I said, well, sister, that it doesn't make much sense. You stand there and tell me it's God's will for you to be sick. It's God's will for you to suffer. And here you are coming up here and wanting me to pray for you. And then what if God heals you? I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for going to him, asking him to heal you. And there, I, I, I'm in a mess with God. So I'm not going to pray for you, and I'm not going to pray for you, but I'll tell you what, if you'll come back and look me right in the eye and say the word of God's true, by his stripes I am healed, and it's God's will for me to be healed, if you'll tell me that, then I'll pray for you. Never forget what she said. She's a real big lady. She looked at me and she said, tell you one thing, I don't like you very much. 
She left the church that night. I went home and cried myself to sleep about her. Holy Spirit said, be patient. You told her in love and it wasn't ugly. You told her in love. I said, thank you, Lord. I'll hold her up to God. Five nights later, five nights later, there I was preaching away. Pre preaching on healing. God can heal anybody act on the word. All of a sudden, I had a prayer line here. They come, and I see that woman coming down the aisle. I said, thank God she must have forgiven me. She loves me again. She came on down the aisle, made her way up slowly up that steps, and got over here by a big grand piano, and she's coming around like we had the prayer line. All of a sudden, the Word of God spoke to me and said, Tell the people if somebody will act on the Word, I'll heal them right now and just confess it, all they need to do. So I turned to them, and in the Spirit, I gave a prophecy and said, The Bible said if you'll act on the Word, He'll heal you right now, and no hands need to be laid upon you. All of a sudden, I heard something go, Wah! And I turned around in time to see that woman just go, Yeah! And the whole platform went, Big lady. Turned around and looked over there and I thought, my, my Lord. I said, if she's not in the spirit, that broke her back for sure. <laughs> broke her back for sure. About that time, a little bitty man came running up just, just a crying and a ball. A little old bitty guy, a little guy, a little ball. Guy, came running up there and got over her and started fanning her with a book like this saying, dear, dear, are you all right? Dear, and you know what she's doing? She's laying there, both hands raised, speaking in the other tongues, and the Spirit gives up. He has been with me just about as long as Senior Elder Bill Canfield, who we honor. We honor all of our leadership, all of our elders. We thank God for you. Thank God for your families. We give honor to our first family, to Miss Joni, to Austin, to Ashton Blair, and to the matriarch of it all, Mother Parsley. But this, this man, is, you know, the Bible says that we should pray that we increase daily in wisdom and in favor and in stature with God and men. My whole professional life, I have had the privilege of having Dwight Thompson out there in front of me leading and reaching back and encouraging for just about as long as Elder Canfield's been here. I got acquainted with him when I was about 23, 24 years old. I came across an old cassette tape. Does anybody remember what those looked like? Come on, tell on yourself. Yeah. How many of you remember 8-Track? <laughs> I just was quickened in my spirit. We, we certainly shall not forget. I don't know what's up with our governor. I, he's busy campaigning. I understand that, but when eight members of one family are executed, the flags ought to be at half staff. So I wish somebody would send him a memo. Uh, I appreciate him. He's a great governor. But uh, our, our state and the nation are grieving with us today for such evil among us, which is all the more reason for us to be here, isn't it? light shining in darkness so we do pray for that family uh, it's a very large family and uh, what kind of evil stalks our lives when someone can walk in and shoot a mother in her bed and leave her four day old baby laying beside her alive what kind of animal is that what are we producing in this society? 
where we've removed God. This is, this is where it all begins. We took God out. And when you take God out, something else fills that vacuum. But we are here, a city set on a hill, a light in a dark place. And so our hearts reach out and pray for that precious family and all those affected, and we are all affected. So he has been beside me, in front of me. He has been behind me, pushing me, beside me, encouraging me, and in front of me, leading me. And I love him with all my heart. He is not a guest, ever. This pulpit belongs to him. He can have it anytime he wants it. He could be a thousand other places today, speaking to crowds ten times the size. But his heart is here with us. His heart is here with me. He has a word for us. Even at times when he filled this pulpit at great meetings, he, he always spoke to us, not to them, to us. So lay your hands on your belly again and say, Today, Today I, receive I receive with great joy, with great joy. One, of the one of the greatest generals of the faith, of the faith. And, the and the prince of preachers to change my life. Now throw both hands up and say, Welcome Dwight Thompson. can be seated. I sure enjoyed that singing. That little tune you, you were doing a while ago, I don't know what that was, but boy, I was liking it. Hello, everybody. Well, I'm home. And I got home. Two, two kinds of people in the church, two kinds, two kinds of people in life, and they're here today. I call them, there's balcony people and there's basement people. Now, I like that balcony bunch more than I do that basement bunch. Because no matter what you're going through, the basement people are always questioning that. And, but balcony people are always saying, you can do that. So I want to be a balcony person today. And I want to speak uh, encouragement into this house. So when they asked me to come, I had a engagement for today and so I said now Lord give me favor with this pastor because I made a commitment here that when uh, I'm needed I'll come so I said Lord let him let him be real understanding and, and he was and so he released me because I felt like I needed to be here and then I'll go back to him So I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help me this morning and, and let me uh, just uh, bring you encouragement today. Can I do that? Yes. And uh, I'm wearing shoes. I preached one time in these shoes and he told me after the service your pastor did, he said, don't wear those shoes anymore. He said, you can't preach a lick in shoes. Get your boots back on. So I thought I'd give it, <laughs> thought I'd give it another shot. 
and see if it was the shoes or me. So we'll, we'll find out here in a minute. You're a precious people. This man of God is extraordinary. And uh, I'm one of those just like you. I got his back. I got his side and we got his front, don't we? So any attack that comes, we know that it's not a personality that this attack is about. It's against the anointing that's upon that life. So uh, I'm going to preach a little bit, and if you want to just relax a little bit or do whatever you do, if you, you can. So I want to just kind of get down here and get started for a few minutes. Can I do that? So can we talk? Can we talk a little bit? And so, Holy Spirit, I ask you just to anoint me and to help me. And uh, we serve notice on the devil here this morning. That uh, he's, he's messing with the wrong crowd. The commission and the mandate from heaven for Pastor Parsley and for this congregation, all hell may attack, but you're wasting your time. Rod Parsley will fulfill World Harvest will fulfill. The best is yet to come. The attack of the enemy is going to be defeated in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody shout, Amen and Amen. Now, the Scripture talks about... Uh, in uh, John chapter 1, verse uh, 29. And uh, you, you, have to, you have to see this. It's not something you can just say. You have to see something. I want to talk about the big picture before I get into this uh, tightening it down, if I may, just a moment. Because we're all part of the big picture. You've got to keep your eye up on the big picture. This is important. So John the Baptist is, uh, he's baptizing people in the Jordan and he's, and he's having a, a move of God there in that Jordan. And all of a sudden he sees somebody coming and he knows that somebody and whether, Pastor, partially if this is the first time that he really laid eyes on him, I've always kind of thought that maybe this, it is, because it caught his attention. I stand corrected on that, but I've researched it. And it seems like as far as the visible, this may very well be the first time that he laid his eyes upon the one that he was commissioned to prepare the people for. Because he's baptizing and all of a sudden, here he comes. The one he's been talking about. He's been talking about him now for a long time. And, and this is what he says. And this is just my part of it, you know. It's my, my, my sermon, so I'll do it the way I want to. And then you do it the way you want to. But this is kind of the way I feel like. This, this is the way he... He didn't go like, oh, oh, well, that looks like him coming right there. But the word he uses is, it, and I think he kind of boomed. I think it was with emotion. Behold. Behold. In other words, don't just take a peek. Everything's about to change what you're about to see. To me, that's the way that comes across. This isn't going to be business as usual after he makes this statement. This is going to be a total seismic shift. That the only way from earth to heaven, 
from earth to God, man, everybody's going to see God one way or another. Want to or not, everybody's going to see God. But from earth to heaven, there's only one way you're going to get there. And he's about to announce it. He's about to make an announcement that's changing totally forever. How fallen man gets back to God. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Everybody shout, Behold. But now, wait a minute, we've got to stop right there, and we've got to, we've got to go back, and uh, we've got to fast forward uh, 16 months. Because 16 months after he makes this statement, now, now he's in a prison. Matthew talks about it. Now he's in a prison. He's not only in a prison. Now, listen to me real closely. This is... This is imperative that we get a little groundwork if we, if we can do this. This is really important to put this total in context because it affects us all. Now then, he's in prison. Matthew uh, records it. And uh, in chapter 11, in verses 3 and 4, it's in the form of a question. And, and the question is this directed to the disciples a couple of his disciples possibly that worked with John the Baptist now 16 months now have gone by since he made that declaration behold the Lamb of God now he's in a prison under a death sentence And now then, a little, a little, medium size, a lot, a question, a hesitation, some trepidation, whatever's going on in his mind at this moment, he knows he's going to die. So he's, he's thinking this over. And he says to his disciples, I want you to, Go find him because the scripture said in verse 2, he's hearing about the works of Jesus. Well, whatever's going on in his mind, all of us could have a conversation about that, but it's important that we address it because he says this. He says to two of his disciples, he's saying, look, he's saying now, I want you to go ask him. Ask him for me. Is that doubt? Is it? Just for this moment, is it the circumstance? Is this, is this really the way it's going to end up? Is this the way this is going to end up? I want you to go ask him. Jesus, ask him for me. Tell him the question comes from me. Are you the Christ? Or do we look for Another. It's important that you understand something. When, that, when that's being posed, there's something going on in his mind. Are you the one? Is this where I wound up? I'm declaring he's the Christ. I'm hearing what's going on, but I got to know. Now let's stop here a moment and let's put a pin in this and let's take a walk into the past because John's thinking all of this over. And he's thinking about how he was born. Now, now you've got to get this. This is really big time stuff. This isn't elementary stuff. This is big time stuff. This sets in motion the movement wasn't called the church at the time, it was called the way. He was going to be called to prepare the way. Oh, hallelujah, that was a good shot. To, you got a good little spot to get 
feisty right there. You wanted to do an amen, you missed a good shot at it right there. The way, but no, what's happening right now? He's remembering, he's remembering his history. His father's name was uh, Zacharias. His mother's name is Elizabeth. Now, there's been 400 silent years from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Everything's been silent. What's going down? We're not hearing from God. That's kind of what it's traditionally called. But now in Matthew, something here is about to take place. And we're talking about this man, an angel. The angel Gabriel didn't speak first to Mary that would become the mother of Jesus. Before you can get a Jesus, you've got to get a preparer. Somebody that's going to prepare the way. I look at Rod Parsley as this is the generation that Rod Parsley isn't running out seeing what's popular and what everybody wants to hear during this culture shift that we don't need to talk about sin anymore or anything else none of that kind of stuff you're okay and I'm okay we're all okay don't worry about anything you can go out and do what you want to and live like you want to it's all okay no no he's standing up there saying you better prepare you the way of the Lord and you've got to do it one way and there's only one way you can do it and that is to repent so can I have a cup of water or a thing going down right now I'm I need a little <laughs> There's something floating in there. <laughs> Baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> that first daughter sitting here, she's just too pretty for her own good. <laughs> but boy, she is one anointed woman of God. You can all do She's a chip off the old block. And the beautiful first lady, Miss Joni. And, and, and her precious brother, Austin. And then, of course, the matriarch that every time she gets up, the devil said, you demons better get on your feet and pay attention. She's on the prowl today. Thank God for a Holy Ghost church that has a foundation. So we got to hurry along with this. Because we got to beat those Baptists to Bob Evans. In here in just a moment. Now follow me. Follow me here for just a moment, if you will. Now this is really important. Everybody say, "You go, boy." You go, boy. All right. So here we are. So Zacharias, you have to understand. And the the angel Gabriel appeared not first to Mary, <laughs> but to Elizabeth. Now Elizabeth and and uh, and her husband, of course. Uh, Zacharias, they, they both came from a priestly family. They both were priests, and they came from a priestly family. And so he's in the temple. Zacharias is in the temple, and he's uh, doing his duties as a priest. And then while he's in there at the altar of incense, all of a sudden, uh, the angel appeared. Not a little angel, uh, one, of the, one of the powerhouses sent from God to break the silence. Now, that was another good spot. Did that, did that give anybody goosebumps but me? The silence is about to be broken. There's one coming, but not just yet. We got to get everybody ready for the one that's to come. So now then, Zacharias is there, and all of a sudden, the angel appears, and he has a name. His name is Gabriel. I like that. Gabriel. And he announced to Zacharias, the priest, that uh, you're going to have a son. And I'm going to give you his name. It's going to be John. And it just sh it shook him. And uh, he said, uh, 
his name will be John, and then, of course, he'll have an assignment. Well, when he finally got out of there, he couldn't do it, and all of a sudden, he said, don't talk. He was struck dumb, or he was mute. He couldn't even speak of it. Went home, and some way, the message to Elizabeth, and it's not long till she uh, conceives, and of course, the miracle is... Uh, they're both on up into years. But this is what... Uh, now, he's remembering. He's thinking this from prison. This is how this whole thing started. Now then, at five months that she's carrying John, Gabriel comes back on the scene. But this time, not to where uh, Elizabeth and Zacharias lives, but to another place. To a little town and, uh, called Nazareth. And there's a little a maiden in there, a little virgin maiden, and the and the same Gabriel that spoke to Elizabeth and uh, to Zacharias is now going to speak to Mary. Thou hast found favor with God. You shall bring forth a son. And he gave him his name. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their what? Sin. What? Sin. What? Do you still think we ought to use the word sin since it's in the Bible? To save his people from their sin? Don't get me started on that. That's, another, that's for another day, for another hour. But this is important that we get the real big picture real quick. So here we are, we have this announcement that's made, the same angel Gabriel to Zacharias and then to Mary, and now then we're about to see a miracle take place. Once it says, after five months, now then the, 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 the angel has said to Mary, you're going to have a son, and then when it goes away, it says that Mary, then she journeys to go see Elizabeth, and that's quite a journey. She's going to have to take a great distance, about 70 miles or so, but she makes her way there, and she stays there for three months and visits their cousins, second cousins, by the way, second cousins. Now, you've got to see this. Can you see it already, what I'm about to do? Can you already see it? you just got to see it. Both of them are pregnant. One's a little, little farther out there than the other. And they greet one another. And the scripture said, when Mary and Elizabeth greeted each other. Now, this isn't in there. I, I think they hugged and sort of bumped. That's just, it's not in there. I read this in the Thompson Concordance, and it's as good as anybody else's idea. Work with me here, people. Work with me. And so, and so they just bumped. No, they didn't really. But anyway, they could have. But if they hugged, they probably did. But, but what happened was, the minute they greeted one another, the scripture says that the baby, John, by the way, full of the Holy Ghost in the mother's womb, the Bible says, begin to leap for joy. The Bible said, Elizabeth would later say, she was filled too with the Holy Ghost. And the baby began to leap with joy. Joy, Elizabeth said. Well, here's the other translation I found out about this. Or I should say the other commentary on it. And, and that's mine. And this is what I think. I think John was saying, let me out of here. Let me out of here. That's him. That's him. i got to tell the world. That's him. That's him. Now John's in prison. Now, one more, one more high drama thing going on. Well, now he's... Uh, Going around, he's preaching a sermon. He winds up in front of Herod. Herod. He's in front of Herod now. And uh, this is recorded in Luke, this particular incident. In, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, in uh, chapter 14 of, of Matthew. He, he winds up in front of Herod. And Herod has a wife. And her name is Herodias. First place, I wouldn't marry a woman named Herodias. <laughs> I said it, and I'm not taking it back. 
I'm drawing a line, not marrying anybody named Herodias. Well, of course, it's a feminine form of Herod is all it is. But now this woman is furious. And this is how he wound up where he is. He is furious at John the Baptist. Of course, John was uh, preaching to him one time. And, and he looked at him and said, you too. It's not lawful what you're doing, carrying on. Oh, God help us if we preach on sin and, and adultery. He said, you're living in sin. Oh, God, how many times have I said it? We don't need puppets behind the pulpit. We need fearless prophets in love that will stand up and declare, thus saith the word of the Lord. Does anybody in this building want to shout amen to that deal? We need somebody that will declare the uncompromising, infallible, irrevocable, unapologetic word of the living God. That's what Rod Parsley does. Footnote, put a pin in that and just tell, don't let me forget where I, I, I'm, I'm going to come right to it, so don't let me forget. But that's exactly what he does. Unapologetically stands up and declares in the face, of, in the face counter to the, to the religious culture, cultural seismic shift that has taken place. He holds the line to the infallible word of the living God. So John the Baptist is standing there and said, you too, you're, you're, you're living in sin. And if you're going to preach against sin and adultery, you, you better get ready to know you're going to get in trouble. Houston, Texas, the mayor there was trying to get all the pastors to send their sermon notes for the following Sunday to what they're going to preach on. That's where we're headed. I've been preaching on this quite some time now. That's where we're headed. That the arm is going to reach right into the church and try to tell this troublemaker, this John the Baptist sitting on this front seat, the boy they're in for a fight. You got a pastor that won't back down, he won't quit, he won't compromise. He is sold out, sold out, sold out, not to the culture. He's not under the hand of some little group, some little peripheral elite group. He doesn't seek the applause of men, but he seeks the approval of Almighty God. The only thing that matters, did you stand before God declaring the uncompromising truth? Well, it made that Herodias thing mad. Boy, that, that thing got on the warpath. So her hubby, her hubby Herod, he's going to have a birthday. And boy, she's got a plan. It's a de devious plan. She's going to get that dude tanked. <laughs> Texas is coming out in me. I thought I had my boots back on. Right. She's going to get him loaded in the drinking and all the carrying on and brought all the close buddies in and all that kind of stuff. It's all in there. It doesn't say it exactly like that, but it's pretty correct. Got them all in there to have a great big party. And that's what it is. They're having a great big party. And then uh, they're going to have a main event. Suddenly in the party, she has a plan and the lights go low, and here comes the dancer, John the Baptist. That's why Baptists don't dance. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> when you're under the anointing, you're not responsible for everything you say. 
Would that be right? <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for putting up with me. I guess my mother dropped me on my head once too often. And anyway, this Herodias guy, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's drunk. He's, uh, the lights are low and the dancer's coming out. You know, I never could figure out how the Baptist got Baptist. Well, it just came to me. John the Baptist. Well, I know what he did. I mean, I know all of that. Okay. I don't know what that means. He's standing there just looking at me. I don't know. Does that mean I'm finished or can I go on? <laughs> so, and so here comes this girl out. Well, we know who she is, of course. It's the daughter. And Herodias has said to the daughter, Salome. Is that the way you pronounce it? Salome. It's got E-M-E -E there on the end of it. So Salome, she comes out, and she really must be a, 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 a well, you, you know. I bet she is hot, baby. I mean, I bet she was pretty. You know what I'm saying? I don't think she's ugly to you. You know what I'm saying? So she comes out, and she begins to dance. And uh, she must have been quite provocative and... She probably was dressed well. I, do, 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 I do, do, don't know what to say right here. I, I got nothing. I'm just going to leave it alone. But in any event, she's dancing, and, and, it, and, it, and it, well, the king, Herod, he says to her, anything you want, I'll give it to you. Half of the kingdom. Even the half of the kingdom is yours. Well, when the music died down, she trotted over to her mom, Herodias, and said, well, what, what do I do now? She said, you tell him you want John the Baptist's head on a platter. Bring it to me. Now, the fact of the matter is, Herod kind of liked him. The scripture infers that quite strongly, quite a uh, matter of fact. He, for some, and did you know there's a lot of people that go to church and they like certain preachers. They'll live like the devil, but they'll come on in because they're just sort of drawn to a personality and, and, and they kind of like them. That's sort of the deal going on for some. He had some kind of strange admiration for John the Baptist, whatever it was. And he didn't really want to do this. But an oath is an oath. He, he reasoned it out. He's got to do what he said he was do when he was drunken. But he didn't really want to do it. But he went ahead and he did it. Yeah. Now then, it gives a lot more meaning to when John would say in prison, knowing he's going to die. He's going to die. I want you to go. I'm going to die. I want you to go ask him, are you the Christ or do we look for another? I want to tell you something about truth. Once you know what you believe, it slams the door on doubt. It doesn't matter how many committee meetings they have. And it doesn't matter how many think, oh, we need to run on out here and find us a teacher that's going to make it a little bit easier for us to where we can feel okay and to give us some kind of, uh, uh, well, you know, kind of affirm us in our lifestyle. We want a religion that will sort of uh, uh, look the other way to, so we can live the way we want to live. But I'm here to tell you, my Bible said he's coming back for a church yeah, yeah. that's without spot and without wrinkle, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Does anybody believe that in the house today? Do we believe that? So he said, I want you to ask him. Now, here is something that happened 
that John the Baptist never, ever got to hear him say, because it wasn't long. Uh, judgment was swift. They decapitated him and brought his head out on a platter and handed it to Herodias. Now think of that. Today, many a preacher that is not going to stand up for Jesus Christ in a very real sense is either going to stand up for Jesus and risk their head on a platter. In other words, they're going to be persecuted. You, uh, what I see in my spirit in the days, weeks, and months ahead, this nation is headed toward big time trouble with God because you can't you, listen it isn't the word just G-O-D that upsets everybody everybody can create some kind of God but the thing that causes the firestorm that they're trying to get rid of they're trying to get rid of the name called Jesus Christ the son of the living God Jesus Peter preached it. There's only one name under heaven given. Why? But whereby men might be saved. And it is the name of Jesus. It's Jesus that saves the soul. It's Jesus that breaks the power of the devil. It's the cross upon which he died. Mister, it's the cross of Christ that the world needs. And if you haven't read Pastor's book on Gone, you better get it. Brother, you will never stray far when you hang on to the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm excited about what's going on in the world today because it tells me something. We may very well be the generation that's going to see the greatest event the world has ever known. And that is the catching away of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I thought we were going to go all through the tribulation. Well, you can go through it if you want to. <laughs> On that first load, I'm out of here, Jack. <laughs> Are you the Christ? Go ask him. Well, this is, a, this is a something else now. He... He got to hear this part. He got to hear the part. He said, you go, and it's interesting in the old King James it uses the word show. That's why a great message is if you can see them, you can see it, it's visual. And this, this is so easy because you can see it. He's heard about the works, go ask him. I'm getting ready to die. I just kind of like to hear it. Amen. He said, you go and show John those things which you do see and hear, that the blind are receiving their sight, and the deaf are hearing, and the lame are walking, and the dead are being raised up, and the gospel is being preached. You go tell them. And the scripture says, and they departed. But it hits me so strongly. John never got to hear that Jesus then began to talk about John to the crowd. And he begins to tell about this man called John. And he makes a statement that would have resonated with such encouragement into John's heart and mind. But it doesn't seem he got to hear that. He began to say, no man born of woman is greater than John the Baptist. Now, I want you to hear me today. World hurts.
serve his church. I look at this church as a church that stands only with some others. That takes a stand that the message that comes out of this pulpit will never be designed to attract the masses out of just being a popular adopting the culture easing up on the tough stuff let's get rid of sin that's over 600 times we'll get rid of that well if you're going to get rid of the word sin out of your vocabulary if you're a preacher shame on you by the way then you've got to get rid of judgment you're going to well if you're going to preach the whole counsel of God that's what you're supposed to be doing that's why it's called a warning should you neglect so great a salvation then I think it's only you deserve to hear the consequences of your choice does that make sense if I, I'm on a highway and it's got a, a sign down here and I'm doing 60 and it's telling me and showing me a curve ahead and it's 30 miles an hour. I don't want to change. I like going 60 miles an hour. I don't care what that sign says. I'm going to go do what I want to do. Well, you go ahead, hard head. And you just keep going 60 miles an hour around that curve and they'll pick you up with a blotter out there and you know it. And so do I. The point of the matter is, I look upon this church and I look upon this pastor. He's like a John the Baptist. That's where I'm going with all this. Well, he is Baptist. Free will. Whatever. I've been teasing about that for over 30 years, I guess. But he, I, I've always looked upon it as a, he's like a John the Baptist church it's not seeking popularity but it's preaching the uncompromising word of the living God this church is committed to healing broken people broken lives Doesn't have, matter how many times you fail, the folks in this church will say, come on, this time you can make it. Just keep going and keep trying, keep going, keep trying. What I love about this church, if my family within, lived within 80 miles or 100 miles, I'd want them to get inside this church. You know why? Because if they'll listen to what that man of God has to say, that man of God is going to watch over their soul. He's a guardian. He's like a man that stands up on a tower and he watches on the landscape to see what's going on. And he stands up and has the courage to say, no, 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 no. Let's be careful. Let's watch this. Let's keep our hand in the hand of the man who steals the water. He'll watch out for you. He doesn't just try to replace something. He repairs things. A man's car broke down on the side of the road. And he's under the hood trying to get that thing fixed. And a guy in a big limo just pulls up and stops and he gets out and he walks over to that uh, Man said, you got car trouble there. He said, yeah. He said, uh, uh, why don't you go ahead and just uh, uh, get in your car there. And, and the man said he was all dressed up in a real uh, fine apparel and got out of that limo. And he said, now, you just sit there. And when I tell you to hit the starter, hit it. So the man, the hood's up. And he tinkers under the hood a little bit. And he gets all that thing going there. And he said, uh, go ahead and uh, hit it now. And uh, he hit that starter, and that thing started up just like that. And he put the hood down, and, and uh, the man said, I, I, Thank you. I, what do I owe you? He said, You don't owe me anything. He, he said, Well, I mean, you stopped, and you helped me, and, and uh, you got out of your limousine, you're in your clothes, and you, 
you, you fix my car. He said, I, I don't know what to say. He said, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Henry Ford. I created that car, and it troubles me to see one of my cars not performing to that that I created it to perform. That troubles me. That bothers me. Well, I want to tell you, Rod Parsley may have been sidelined for just a little bit, but I'm here to tell you, all of us, what Jesus does, he looks at every one of us when we're on the side of the road, and he said, I did not create you to remain on the side of that road. I created you to live the life that I have said you can live if you will follow me. He didn't create you to shoot dope up your veins. He didn't create you to have alcohol going down into your stomach. He didn't create you to live in fear under the power of the devil. He didn't create you to be broken down on the side of the road with no help and no hope. He created you to be a powerful, dynamic champion for Jesus Christ. And that's what World Harvest Church offers. So the whole point of this message, and I'll, I'll shut her down, kind of like right in here, is this. John never heard those words. You're doing a lot better than you think you are, by the way. You say, well, uh, how do, uh, you don't know what I'm going to do. How, how do you know that? Well, for one thing, you're, you're here today in church. That's, that tells me a lot. You're here right now. You may have been out on Saturday night and misbehaved somewhat, but I'll tell you what. You still, you're doing better than you thought you are. You got up this morning. You realize what you did last night isn't doing you any good. But I'm going to get myself up. I'm going into the house of God because I'm broken. And I need someone that knows how to repair me. All right. All right. Once my soul was astray from the heavenly way. I was wretched and vile as could be. But a Savior in love, he reached down from above when he reached down his hand for me. So I'm here to tell Rod Parsley that John the Baptist for our generation, we're standing by our man. We're standing by him. Because I'll tell you one thing, I'll tell you one thing, it wasn't the hand that the enemy attacked, not his foot. Boy, you've got on wild socks. These are cool. I'm boring. I need to get it to go in there out here. He, he did, it wasn't his foot he attacked or his leg. It's that voice. You said, well, we, we've been through this with him for a, a year. Well, that ain't even an option for this preacher. I'll come mow his yard if I have to. Well, I'll get Zonel to come do that, and I'll just say, get on that thing, get out there and do it. <laughs> the whole point is, the whole point is, we know what this is all about. This is an attack upon the the anointing that's upon his life. The devil wants to shut him down. The devil wants him to quit talking. 
the devil wants, but we're, we're, we, we want the devil to know something. So pay attention, dude, wherever you are. He ain't alone. He's got the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and the angels in heaven and a whole lot of life believers that are going to stand with him no matter what. So here's, here's the big picture. Here's the big picture. The big picture is simply this. This church is called Prepare the Way. Get people ready. John preached it. He's coming. That was his message. Get ready. 2016. Rod Parsley's preaching. Get ready. He's coming. We had a bunch of guys on TV one time arguing. Mid-trib, post-trib, pre-trib. Good, back and forth. Finally, I like what Paul Crouch, he happened to be on the road that time. He just kind of had it with all of them. Well, what they're all trying to say is you better get ready, and you better get ready right now because he can come before the program is over. But I'm afraid there's a lot of people that now have been sold a bill of goods. They can go out and live any way they want to do. It's all covered. It's all covered up. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But I want to tell you something. My Bible said when you and I became a child of the living God, our hunger for the world lost its appeal and it's lost its attraction. What the world gives me, I don't want it because what I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. The world can't take it away because the world didn't give it to me and it'll take me from earth to heaven and it seals my every longing. Yes, I know Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. So I'm closed as this is my second close. I'm one of the world's great closers. I've been known to close an hour. Listen to me closely now. Jesus said, now you go and tell him. It's the right one. He's got the right one. All is well. John's getting ready to die. But Jesus is already on the move. He's already working. Nothing's going to stop him. That's the deal. Nothing now will stop him. The blind are seeing. The lame are walking. The deaf are hearing. The dead is being raised. Lepers are being cleansed. What he did then, he's doing it now. Brother, he's coming for a glorious church. Let me close really with this one thing. The star of the football team in a small town they won their game that would send them to the championship. The day before the championship game, the star quarterback's father died. The boy was grieving. The coach said, son, don't you worry about the game. Go home. Grieve. Bury your father. We'll be okay. This is most important. The next day, the morning they buried the father, that evening he showed up for the championship game. And the boy played the greatest game of his career. The coach was overwhelmed. Son, he said, I don't get it. Your father died, and you've come, and you've played the greatest game, and you won MVP in the championship. How did you do it? 
He said, Coach, what you don't know, from junior high to high school, my father was at every practice, every game. He never missed a one. But what you don't understand, he was totally blind. And tonight is the first time he ever saw me play a game. Go and tell John the blind are seeing, the lame are walking. The gospel is going forth. Well, Harvest Church is being faithful to the call of God. Give yourself a hand today. Hallelujah. Somebody shout, we won't quit. We won't back down. We won't compromise. We will never, 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 never compromise the truth. I want my pastor to come up here and stand. And I want you to let him know we will never, never get discouraged. We will never, never quit. Please, please be seated for just, just a few minutes with me now. Now, I'm privy to a, a few things, and one of the things that I heard that was sent to me before I came that really got my attention. These three months that you're, I had a, I had a talk with him before the service, and I kind of talked to him kind of like a Papa a little bit, didn't I? Yeah. Kind of a little bit. And uh, I said, how did I put it? There's no, nobody remembers a dead preacher, but about two days after he's gone, and it's all forgotten. That's a phrase you always hear. And I wanted him to know He's needed. This voice is needed. This message he preaches is needed. And whatever it takes, we will take up the slack and we will hold on to the horns of the altar until his voice is a hundred percent strong. But I, I found out that when you, during all that time, you sit down just for a moment, this is, I've come a long way knowing that God led me to do this, that during that three months before that you lost nearly a hundred thousand dollars in those three months and just the giving right here in the church we, there's always going to be people who say well we'll wait till you know we'll wait till he gets strong again and go in and then then, then we'll be back now he's got to do this I, I'll come I'll be your assistant and his assistant, Bill, Bill Canfield, I'll be his assistant. I'll do what I have to do. But I'm here to tell him, you're going to take care of yourself. And we're not going.
we're, we're not, we're not going to drop $100,000 more again during this three-month time. But you need to rest that voice. Now, I know you've got a parade of people coming and all of that kind of thing, but I'll do what I have to do when you need me to come. I'll do what I have to do. But it's the, it's the voice. It's the voice that he's, the enemy attacks the voice. This will not stand. I'm angry. I'm angry at the enemy. And I applaud you. I want you to know I applaud you. I applaud the people that are standing faithful with their pastor. I want to give a thousand dollars in an offering this morning, but I'm not asking you to do that. But I am asking, I am asking a hundred people at least that will give a hundred dollars and pledge between now and the next three months that you'll increase giving to where the church isn't placed in any kind of Jeopardy, but every ministry involved in this great work of World Harvest, 14 major ministries, and none of it will be uh, sacrificed. So here's what I just really feel led of the Holy Spirit to do. I want at least a hundred people in this room that says, uh, I, I want to give a hundred dollars this morning. But on top of that, I pledge every week by the help and the grace of God that I'm going to give extra. And I know you've given sacrificially. But I just feel like I want him to know as, his, as an evangelist how much I love him and how much I believe in him. How much I love this church. All those count meetings that we did. And I remember one time I was preaching on Mr. Your Phone's Ringing and all the lights blew out. And I never did get to finish that message. Do you remember that? Air conditioning, all of it. Everything. We just moved in here. and It just all went out and the emergency thing came on. And, and I was up here yelling, trying. And boy, the Holy Ghost began to move and people started streaming forward come into God man here they may not have all heard me and they were stacked up to the back beyond those curtains but brother I'm here to tell you something you might as well try and dam up Niagara Falls with a box of toothpicks because you that's about how much chance you've got in stopping the authentic move of God the devil is a loser and God is a winner, and Well Harvest is a winner, and the best is yet to come. Rob Parsley, the best is yet to come for you. In the name of Jesus. I got a bunch of grandkids. I could sell one or two of them. I want everybody in this building that'll just do it. Just do it because you can do it. Do it even if it's sacrificial. It's, it's the big picture. John carried it. Told by Gabriel even before Jesus was born. And he gave his life to tell the world, prepare the way. And Rod Parsley is giving his life and the enemy wants to kill him 
but he's got to go through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and the angels, and Gabriel, and me. I'll get my boots back on, dude, and my spurs, and we'll forget that. I almost got two Texas right there, too much Texas. Everybody will join me in $100 when I count to three. I want you to make a show of it. And it's almost like you're running up here to raise his hands up. And that guy canceled today. I'll go preach for him uh, next week. But right now, my priority is right here. Right here. With you. So I'm, I'm standing with you. And we're going to stand with him. Amen. And we're not going to be down $100,000 in three months. Stick with him. Be faithful. Come. And you just showing up. You just have no idea what it does for him. You just have no idea what it does for him. You got your money ready? We're just going to start right here. Let's just do it. Everybody that'll do it, I want you to just jump to your feet when I count to three. And I want you to just come and just stand right here. Let's just make a show of it. Give me a hundred people. You see, I gave last week... This is really important that we just set the stage for the victory is in the voice. The victory is in the voice. On three, everybody that'll do it with me right now, all the way from the pack, I see people getting up. Just get up on your feet and come on forward right now. One, two, three. Let's get them on up here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Keep coming, keep coming, just keep coming. Keep coming, just keep coming. Keep coming. Brother Bill, come on up here and just stand with us. You're just an amazing man. And uh, come on up here and stand with me. Brother, Brother Mike, uh, come on up here and stand. I want to get some men, a couple of more men, and some of you powerhouse ladies to come on up here. And I want you to lay your hands upon him, but we're not through with the offering yet. There's going to be a victory in this. There's others. I want you to come. You're still bringing your offering. I'll, I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you right now. Just come on. The Holy Ghost is speaking to you, so... Come on and stand with us. Come on and stand with us right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I commend you. I congratulate you. How many in this room right now will say, Dwight Thompson, I'll, I'll give $50 this morning. Just get on your feet. Just start standing up wherever you are. I'll give $50. Everybody that can do that, just get on your feet out there. I want us to get this three-month thing started off powerfully. Powerfully. I'm just praying, Lord, give us $10,000 extra a week. How many will get in faith with me on this? I'm praying. I mean, just above all the regular, but I'm just believing for $10,000 more a week. That'll just come in and every need will be met. Everything will be met. And during this period of time, I don't know why people do what they do, but I'll tell you one thing at World Harvest, they won't be doing it. We're standing by the man of God. We're standing by it and we're going to get. Everybody believe that. Everybody believe that. Everybody believe that. How many will give at least $20? Just stand to your feet wherever you are. Let's make it 100%. And before we receive the offering, 
Lay your hands upon him right now in the name of Jesus. I want spirit-filled people in this building to lift your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost. Right now, the angels of the Lord, the angels of the Lord go about him. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. These vocal cords will be made perfect and he will declare, he will declare the uncompromising Word of God with the seven time anointing upon his life. Peace. 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 Lord, just give him peace right now. Peace in his spirit. Everybody say that, Lord, just fill him with peace. Everything's going to be all right. Shout it. Pastor, everything's going to be all right. Shout it aloud. Everything's going to be all right. Hallelujah. Well, I want us to get our offering now and we're going to leave it right here somewhere how do we want to do it uh, right here on the steps right up here on this just place it and uh, yeah just place it and then when you get it placed I'm going to pray for people while you're doing all of this now Father in the name of Jesus everybody just get on your feet now and let's all bring our offering and just, just bring it on down is that okay pastor can I just have them bring it on just bring it on down. The moment you give it, you just, you can head on back to your seat. And uh, I don't know, I just, you're not going to try and talk right now, are you? You're not going to try and talk right now, are you? All right. We can pass buckets, by the way. Go ahead, ushers, if you want to do that. That's easier for everybody. We just want to get everybody in this offering right now. It's really important. I see a lot of you got your money in your hand. Just bring it forward if you want to. But go ahead, ushers, and just pass the buckets all around right now. And just let people give. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I leave here. I go get on a plane. and I fly back to Dallas here in a little while. And then tomorrow night I'll be on Trinity and we'll believe in God for a great miracle night. And I'm going to tell them on Trinity tomorrow night what God did in World Harvest today. Hallelujah. I'm going to talk about you on TV tomorrow night. Hallelujah. I just feel like I want to hear a shout of a hallelujah. hallelujah. Victory is in the voice. Victory, victory, victory. Yeah. What was that song you were doing a while ago? That you had that little tune to it. I just loved it. It's called Everything Comes Alive. That's exactly the way we feel. Everything comes alive. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the wonderful privilege to be here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, by the way, let me just tell all of you this. Thank you for praying for my wife. This week, she got her driver's license. God is faithful and the best is yet to come. Stand by your pastor.
stand by your church and victory is yours in Jesus' name. Pastor Penfield, whoever. Come on, let's thank evangelist Dwight Thompson for being with us here today. Let's let him know that we appreciate his ministry to us and his obedience to God.